Hey, there we go. Hi. And magically, my uh, martini, uh, my uh, Manhattan appeared. I love to see it. <laughs> I love to see it. So are we good to go here? Okay, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna introduce ourselves. I'm gonna, I'm gonna welcome everyone. I'm gonna do it right now. Um, this is a new and exciting uh, moment for NYT Cooking and indeed for the New York Times as uh, we bring this forth to you uh, on YouTube Live on Zoom. My name is Sam Sifton. I'm an assistant managing editor of the New York Times and the founding editor of NYT Cooking. I also write a newsletter uh, and do some other stuff. Um, I'm here this evening uh, with my good friend and colleague, Melissa Clark, a national treasure uh, who writes the Good Appetite column for the Times, um, is a, uh, now a pantry columnist for the New York Times, <laughs> and the author of, I think, it's hard to keep track, but I think of 279 cookbooks. <laughs> um, we're gonna be chatting a little bit uh, before we go off to, to cook dinner. You're welcome to ask us questions uh, in the live chat uh, module on YouTube. Um, we're recording this event um, and uh, we're gonna have a good time. Um, but I gotta check in with Melissa. As a manager, it's very important to check in and see how everyone's doing. Melissa, how are you doing? Right now I'm doing very well. I'm here, I get to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I have a Manhattan. Oh, uh, I have a Manhattan as well. But my glass is so much classier, Sam. What's up with that? <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is you're classier than I am in every way. <laughs> um, mine may be bigger, though. That, that probably is true. Um, are uh, you at home? I am at home. Uh, yes, that is where I have been and will be. I, we're I'm, we're at, in our Brooklyn Brownstone. We're hanging, you know, staying, hunkering down, as they say. Um, we have stuff coming up in pots in my deck. So I have some mint and it's just lovely to see spring unfold out the window. And, you know, we're, we're okay. I feel very lucky. We are okay. It's the three of us. It's my husband and daughter and myself. Great. And what's for supper tonight? Oh, okay. So um, I went to the farmer's market and I got clams. I got those little butter clams. Do you know? Ah, those are great. Do, do you know about those? I never. Yeah, had, I, never I had. like them. They're they're small. Yeah, they're yeah, small. they're good for pasta. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do pasta with clam sauce with those little butter clams. So uh, that is the plan. What about you, Sam? What are you gonna do after this? Well, it's complicated. I um I have um I have a big pork butt um kind of dry aging in the, in the fridge under a shower of salt and, and sugar. And I was thinking that uh, I might do like a bosom yeah, um, as a crazy as a crazy midweek uh, adventure. But I I've only been an assistant managing editor of the New York Times for about 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> and it turns out there are a lot of meetings. Um, and I got really jammed up in a bunch of stuff. So I don't think I think if I did it, I we'd be eating around two in the morning. Um, <laughs> and I want to avoid that. So yep. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna freestyle when I get down there. Ah, uh, a little, a little, maybe some pasta or some rice and beans. I know that's your favorite. Rice and beans is your go-to, right? I'm, I'm loving rice and beans right now. Yeah. Um, I think um, it's, it, it's a really excellent way of using up everything that you have, um, just little ends of, of meat and stuff, um, uh, along with you know a couple alliums and some. And as I told you before, we talked about this before, yeah. a splash of citrus. I know. I love that. I haven't done that yet, but I keep thinking about that splash of citrus. And I have, you know, so I have all these cara cara oranges in the fridge. I stocked up on citrus. Um, so I have all these cara caras and I need to start using them. And so I've been um, cutting the, the peels off and, you know, like kind of, you know, with a knife to get them nice and juicy. And I cut yep. that, the flesh up and I eat that or I give it to my daughter. And then I have these peels that have some of the flesh clinging and I have been squeezing it into a little bowl. So I'm like collecting this cara cara juice and um, over the past couple of days. And so I'm going to, I'm thinking I'm going to do some, some bean type thing with it, just like you were saying. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Are you keep keeping the peels as well? Well, you know, for the most part, um, confession here, I know I'm drinking, uh, Manhattan was, um, it seemed to be the cocktail of the evening, but we've been drinking a lot of Negronis. So mm -hmm. we've actually been zesting those cara caras. So they're pretty, you know, so they've got the pith on them, but they don't have the zest anymore. So at this point, it's just the 
So there's nothing it's else. It's just to, nothing. Yeah, I don't no, know what to do. I mean, there's nothing you can do with pith, right? That pit, that bit. You, you can <laughs> compost it. I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> we don't even have compost pickup anymore. Oh, that, you know, it's, I have to say, that's one of the things I miss the most is my compost bucket. I'm like, oh, I, I'm throwing all this stuff out. It just feels so painful. <laughs> Because we don't we don't have anywhere to compost in my house, so I've been bringing it to the farmers market. But they're not doing food scrap pickup right now. So well, that makes sense at this at this juncture. At this moment, do you have a comp? Are you compost? Do you um, compost? I yeah, we have a we have a good pile uh, going that works out pretty well. I keep thinking we'll add chickens to the mix, um, and that that would be really good. But um, let's just get through this. Let's get through this virus uh, first. I'm really interested to know, Melissa, what you're hearing from readers. And we're beginning to hear from readers uh, in the audience tonight. Um, and I'll ask you some questions as, as they pop up and ask myself some questions as they pop up. But I'm interested to know what you're hearing from readers since you launched your pantry cooking column. You know, it's been great. Um, reader, I have gotten a lot of emails. People are emailing me directly. They're emailing me through my website. They're messaging me on Instagram. They're leaving comments. And um, people seem to be, you know, I, I think everybody's cooking in a way that we haven't been. Nationally, we have not cooked like this together pretty much ever. You know, it's like every year on Thanksgiving, we all cook together, right? But this is a different thing. This is a different way of all of us cooking together because it's it keeps us sane. It's cozy. It feeds us. It feeds us emotionally. It feeds us us and our families physically. And you know we have to do it because we're not going out. So we're all cooking as a nation in a way that we haven't cooked in a sustained way. And it's it's really. I mean, I feel that positive energy aside from everyone else, everything else going on in the world. I feel that and I feel good about it. And people are excited to get new recipes. They're excited to converse with each other. You know, you look at the comments and they're talking to each other. They're answering their questions. And I feel like, you know, at NYT Cooking, we have a community, right? We have a very strong community, but I see it going beyond that. I see it in the rig in the rest of the New York Times because these recipes are outside the paywall. So it's really lovely. Um, it is a silver lining for sure. What about oh, you, Sam? What are you, is. what are you seeing? Is it same kind of thing or? Well, it's interesting. I've taken um, a very different approach to the newsletter that I write. Um, usually it's, you know, a few jokes, a couple recipes, a couple links to some rock and roll songs and, and we move out. But I feel a powerful need to communicate almost intimately with uh, the, the readers and to, and to offer them some sense that what we're going through, we are in fact going through together. Yeah. Uh, and that cooking does provide a way to bring a little bit of joy and beauty and style into um, what is otherwise a really difficult uh, situation. So I find myself almost um, in a fireside chat. Um, it's big dad energy, you know, yes. as opposed to uh, cheerleader uh, energy. And I think the most interesting thing that I've um, kind of been grappling with and have figured out over the course of the past couple of weeks is the intense freedom that we're offering readers when we allow them to make these recipes themselves, um, to, 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 to go well beyond what we've suggested. Um, our recipes are, you know, bulletproof in terms of, of testing, but by no means does that mean that you can't change them um, according to what you have on, on hand. And so, I, I thought you'd love this, Melissa. Last night, I wanted to do it. I've never made, confession, I've never made Allison's Romans the stew. Oh, Hashtag. I haven't either. Oh my gosh, and Okay, I, I, and it's on my list. How was it? It was great, I'm sure. Well, it, I don't think it was the stew. I didn't have any turmeric. I had Jamaican curry powder. Um, I only had a can of chickpeas instead of two. I only had one uh, can of coconut milk instead of, Two. I did have a half pound of really excellent ground beef that I got um, from a farmer. I'm very on brand to add beef to that dish. Anyway, it was fantastic. I put like a metric ton of kale in there at the end, and it 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 was an absolutely delicious representation of an internet famous stew that only shared some of the preparation and some right. of the ingredients with the original and it was great and so 
being able to talk with readers about that um, has been one of the great uh, privileges, I think, of the last couple of weeks. Hey, we've got a I'm, a, I'm just gonna throw questions as they great. pop in and look interesting yeah. to me. This is a question from a woman named Lucy. And Lucy, like you, has noted um, that spring has sprung. And I'm guessing that uh, Lucy lives in a place that is not um, like Prospect Heights, where <laughs> perhaps out in the woods, you might be able to find some ramps. She's got some ramps and needs some advice on how to use them. Oh, ramps, you're so lucky. That's wonderful. I keep waiting for ramps to appear at the farmer's market, but not yet. Um, okay, so, you know, treat ramps. I always say the easiest way to, to think about ramps, they're just, they're like scallions with a different flavor. You can use them in any way that you wanted, to, that you would want to use a scallion. Um, so you just take off the roots in the outer layer, just like you would a scallion. But the good thing about ramps is the greens. So you have the white bulb and then you have the greens on the top, right? The white bulb is like a scallion white. You can slice it thin, you can saute it, you can steam it, you could pickle it. But the greens are like oniony flavored spinach and you can saute them and, or you can add them to any kind of dish. So you really get, you get both. Um, one of my favorite things to do is I love bacon and ramps together. I think there's something about that fresh oniony flavor of the ramps and then that porky fatty bacon that goes really well together. So I use it as a pasta sauce is one of my favorite things. Saute the, the whites first in, and some bacon together. And then you deglaze it with a little bit of white wine. I, you know, I like to just take my glass and just pour a little in and um, some garlic, add a little garlic. And then the tops of the ramps, the greens, you just put it in like spinach, saute it with some Parmesan on pasta, delicious. Oh, that's great. Here's the difference between you and me. That's your first question. My first question is, what's your favorite Fleetwood Mac record? Ha! Well, because it's you write rumors. about culture too. It's different. I mean, nobody, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, nobody's going to ask me my musical questions, which is a good thing because, you know, <laughs> you don't want to hear the answers. But you're a font of good knowledge about literature. I love talking books with you. Well, I love to read. So, you know, I, um, I, I found it very comforting right now. I'm reading a book about World War II, which just make, puts a lot of this in perspective for me. I feel like, you know, we're not being bombed and we have enough food as a nation. We are not short of that. So it, it makes me feel a lot better. I'm reading um, Anthony Pohl, um, A Dance to the Music of Time. And there oh, is, great. it's a bunch of different volumes and I'm on volume three, which is, you know, 500 pages about World War II, so. Yeah. <laughs> You like operas in your books as well. You like I like long really long movies. things. I like yeah. long books and long operas because that way it's like once I'm once I it takes me a while to walk through that door. Do you know what I mean? And if yeah. I'm gonna do something, I want to stay in it. I don't want to like and then just like have to leave. So <laughs> that's great. What are you reading? So right I gotta, what are you reading right uh, now? Um, I'm reading questions, and we've got some awesome ones. We'll come oh, okay. back to books in a in okay. a second. I've got a nice one here for. Uh, using this uh, the sourdough starter that you discard when you're making room in your in your um, sourdough uh, pot um, yeah. for for more and there's a great recipe for this on nytcooking.com. Um, I make um, pancake batter or waffle batter out of it um, and make it um, kind of let it go overnight before adding um, egg and 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 butter and a little baking powder. And uh, the results are just phenomenal. I would highly recommend um, anyone who's interested in, in using up that sourdough uh, starter to do so with um, pancake or, or waffle batter. That said, I, I riffed on some, I added a little sourdough to some muffins I made the other day, um, uncharacteristically, I might add. And they were, they were, they were pretty fantastic. So there's, there's a lot of use for it. Um, I'm gonna go from sourdough rise to yeast rise and go to you, Melissa. Stephanie is asking, um, what's the difference between instant yeast and regular yeast? Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's one of those real, okay. Cause there's instant yeast, there's regular yeast and then there's rapid rise, rise yeast, right? So I, for a long time, I was confusing instant yeast with rapid rise cause instant just makes me think fast but that's, it's actually not true. So. Instant yeast is a yeast that is more easily soluble. It's a finer grind 
of yeast. It's, it's very fine. So that, you know, when you get active dried yeast, so active dried yeast come in the little packets and you need, you usually need to proof them. And they're pretty, they're like kind of big lumps. They're like breadcrumb sized, right? And you proof them in order to get them to dissolve. You want to add a, usually you add the liquid first. I mean, you don't have to, it, eventually they will awaken and they will rise. You know, they'll make your bread rise, but it takes a long time. Instant yeast, immediately dissolves upon hitting water. So you can just mix that in with your dry ingredients. So if you're making a bread, you don't need to proof the yeast. You don't need to add the yeast, the liquid to yeast, just add the yeast in with your flour if it's instant and then it'll all come together. It's not faster, but it is more, um, it just integrates better into the bread. Um, We've switched over to instant yeast. We find it a little more convenient. I mean, I use both. And then rapid rise yeast is, magic. It just makes everything go a lot. You know, it will rise that same bread in half the amount of time. The thing is that you lose, because you're, you don't have the fermentation time, you lose some of the flavor. So rapid rise yeast is good for things where you have a lot of other stuff giving you flavor, like babka is fine because you have so mm -hmm. much, you know, other stuff going on, but you don't really want to use it. I, I don't like to use it for just like a plain white bread or whole wheat because you lose, or pizza dough, because you lose that flavor of fermentation. Is that yeah, clear? Yeah, the fermentation. <laughs> yeah, that the fermentation is so, so important. Yeah. Um, we've got a question uh, that goes to both of us. I'll start because I've seen the, the question and let you go second. And it's about what um, our most memorable cooking or baking fiascos might be. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go first, as I say. I was invited to dinner once. I, I, I actually told the story in, in, um, in the book that I just wrote. Um, and Melissa has a book out now too dinner in French. I have one out um, called See You on Sunday, a cookbook for family and friends. Not a great time to gather in large groups, as I argue. But um, I was once invited uh, to a dinner for Nora Ephron. And the idea of the dinner was that each one of us would bring, it was a potluck, and each one of us would bring a dish inspired by Ms. Ephron. <clears throat> and I brought a meatloaf, or I was going to make a meatloaf. And it was a fancy meatloaf. And for fat and flavor, I used uh, pancetta. And I purchased the pancetta from Fairway Market. And uh, I wanted it because I was jamming and going fast. I wanted it sliced thin from the deli counter, which I received. And I went home and I chopped it all up. And I, because I wanted it really thin to lard through and melt into uh, the meatloaf. Um, and it was a it just, I know this meatloaf, I know it's an excellent meatloaf. I've made it a million times. Uh, and I made it this time. And what I didn't realize was that the guy, the deli slicer guy, did not remove the plastic sheath from the pancetta and sliced it so thinly that it was indetectable to me as I was preparing it. But then it kind of, um, seized up in the heat of the oven and my meatloaf emerged looking furry. <laughs> there were little fronds of plastic sticking out of every available surface of, of the meatloaf. Um, and, and that was just a gigantic fiasco. And I had to really hustle to make another meatloaf with different ingredients um, to take to the party for Nora Ephron, which I did. And, um, and that worked out very well. She loved it. <laughs> How about you, Melissa? Oh my gosh. You know, it's funny because um, we have talked about this before and um, I try to, um, whenever I have a fail and I have a lot of fails, you know, like I overcook stuff, I undercook stuff. I mean, there's always, you know, that like horrible moment where you, you do like a big, huge piece of meat, like a really expensive, you know, prime rib like roast, you know, and you, or a crown roast of pork, something you've spent over a hundred bucks on and you take it out of the oven and it's overcooked or undercooked. And usually in my house, it's undercooked because I'm so afraid of overcooking. And then, you know, you cut it, especially when you're, you're dealing with pork. So I have cut into pork and it's been like bleeding. And, you know, I mean, I even don't mind a little pink, but I don't <laughs> want it to bleed. Um, so then, you know, but because I'm a professional, I can't tell anybody. <laughs> have to like hide be like oh you know have some more hors d'oeuvres and um, then I'll be like searing it I'm like oh crown roast to pork no 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 pork chops I met I, we were having pork chops the whole time it was right um, <laughs> but so that's the thing this is my big advice for people is don't ever admit defeat just change the name of the dish so 
even though there might have been rumors of crown roasted pork, no, 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 it was pork chops all along, you know, gaslight them a little bit. Yeah, I like um, that. Or, um, or I always say that, you know, I have been known to serve bitter eggplant salad. It's supposed to taste like that. Um, <laughs> Or what were some of the other ones? It's like, like, you know, oh, this is my flat souffle. Yes, no, it's a specialty of a teeny region in my imagination. Um, and it's supposed yeah. to look like that. So just, you know, um, I mean, if it truly is bad, like stuffed curdles or whatever, and you can't serve it, then you're, then you're stuck. But if it tastes good enough and you can doctor it up, I mean, often overcooked meat can be fixed with a sauce, you know? Um, yeah, totally. undercooked meat, obviously you put it back on the grill. If your eggplant salad is a little bitter, a little salt, a little olive oil, and so lemon juice will work wonders. So there's usually a way to like make something, um, something work. And, you know, I mean, although the other day I baked, I baked a pumpkin bread, I was playing with this pumpkin bread recipe and it just, the center was goo. It was just goo. So I cut out, you know, I cut out the edges like a donut, <laughs> I threw right. out the center. And we ate the edges and they were really good. <laughs> they were pumpkin bread edges. That's life with Melissa Clark, that's, folks. Yeah. It's always delicious, but you I'm might have to throw I'm going to just do the best the I can center. here. <laughs> that's great. So listen, you're in New York City. And um, even uh, as New York City has emerged as, as this um, terrifying center of the outbreak in New York State, which is... Uh, in, in really bad shape compared to a lot of the rest of the, the country, even still, um, you're able to get to the market and the markets have been doing an incredible job of uh, feeding the citizens of, of New York through, throughout this crisis. And, you know, you're able to get cara cara oranges and you're able to get, you've got a few herbs on the, but there are places in the country where people are um, not getting great, um, food and vegetables. There's plenty of food, don't get me wrong, but the notion of a fresh salad is terrifying to them or they, they haven't gotten the greens, they're running out of vegetables. Um, they're in, they, they haven't adopted the Sam Sifton technique of eating rice and beans all the time and loving it. Um, what suggestions do you have for people who are craving a salad, but who, but who can't really deliver on a salad? Yeah, you know, this is true. Um, I feel very lucky. I have been able to get pretty much, I mean, it's like, I can't get everything I want, but I'm, I'm doing fine, you know, and I know that that's not true of everyone out there. Um, I see the comments, people are saying, oh, I can't get eggs, I can't get flour, I can't get salad. Um, but for salad, there's some easy fixes, because uh, anything green can be made into a salad. We just don't think of it. You know, we're so used to having our, our boxes of, you know, washed baby greens and spinach that we're not like using, we're not being creative, but I love to do um, crunchy, hard keeping vegetables. Like I call them keeping vegetables because they keep for a long time, like radishes, celery. Like how old is that thing of celery in your fridge? It might even be a month old and it's fine. Um, carrots, you know, fennel. These are vegetables that just hang out in the vegetable drawer. They're, they do fine for a month. So if you can get those, get those and then Th slice them really thin. If you have a Ben Reiner or a mandolin, you get these nice shavings, but you can use a knife and just get thin, thin slices. And then it's like when you toss them with olive oil and lemon juice in a bowl, they, I swear to God, they're like lettuce leaves almost. They're like fluffy and they're light and they're crunchy and they're juicy and they are perfect. And we have been eating a lot. We eat a lot of celery salad these days, a lot of cucumber, radish salad. Oh, this is a really good one. Sometimes I take cucumber and radishes because I always have those on hand because I love them and then I mix them with yogurt just like nice. a lot more sour cream and salt and cumin and just eat the, and it's like a big bowl of that for lunch is so satisfying and then it's just creamy and but it's fresh and juicy one vegetable you didn't mention that's been um central to what I've been doing these last couple of weeks has been cabbage Ooh, cabbage um, yes perfect and, and I find that treating it just as you suggest to get it, you know, kind of super, super thin and fluffy and then dressing it with a little lime juice and, and salt yeah. is a kind of revelation. It's like we had some the other night and I thought this is the best salad I've ever made. And it's just cabbage, lime juice and salt. Oh, yes. I'm with I mean, you. Cabbage is I love I love cabbage, but unfortunately, I'm the only person in my house who loves cabbage. So 
this is yeah so it's and being very we're all very close together so i have not been cabbaging it up i but when when i'm eating by myself i actually have this thing one of the dishes you know like my guilty pleasures that i'm eating by myself is i eat a big huge i take cabbage i melt it in a pan with butter chicken stock parmesan chili peppers and tons of olive oil butter and olive oil is key and i just eat this huge bowl of it and it makes wow. me so happy <laughs> that's a recipe right there it's, a, it's it a good one Cabbage and just, spaghetti with no, what are they no called? Spaghetti. What's that thing that we, oh, the spiralizer. It's like you spiralized your cabbage and turned it into pasta. Uh, yes. um, we have um, a, a, a watcher, a listener, a reader um, named Richard, um, who has a, a really um, tough and interesting question, which is what to cook if you have COVID-19 or you've lost your sense of taste and, and smell. And that seems that's for people like us who, who um, uh, work in taste and smell, it must be so difficult to, to be that person. Um, I wonder what advice we can give. I'm, I'm thinking that even without a sense of taste or, or smell that may be, um, fiery heats and, and malas and things like that might help cut through. Um, have you ever I, had I that just same think of like ever... chicken soup and congee and. Have you ever lost your sense of smell? Has that ever happened to you when you've gotten just a bad cold? I've, d I've, I've gotten bad colds where I, I can't smell and, and I don't, I haven't talked to anyone who's suffering from COVID-19 about this issue. Um, but even with a bad cold, I do find that if I eat pretty fiery, spicy food, it gets uh, the nose running and, and, I can, and I can taste or smell a, a, a little bit. Because this happened to me about two years ago, actually a year and a half ago. Obviously, it wasn't COVID-19. It did never happened to me before. I completely and utterly lost my sense of smell and taste. Nothing got through. No spicy chilies, no garlic, nothing got through. And it lasted for nine days. And I didn't tell anybody at work about this because I was afraid. I was like, are they going to fire me? I was doing recipe. I mean, obviously not, but I was like, I, it was oh, the no. worst. Let me be clear. We would have fired you. <laughs> it was all, I was trying to develop recipes and I couldn't, I couldn't work. I could not work. Um, and I would carry around a piece of ginger root in my pocket and I would try to smell and I would, and I would, you know, and I, I would, and I just nothing. And I, I went, I remember going out to dinner with some friends and I just was like, why am I here? It was awful. So I, my heart goes out to people, but the thing that, you know what I ate, all I wanted was all texture. It was because nothing went through. It was just texture. So I just craved textures. So I would crave crunch or I would crave soft. So mm -hmm. I ate a ton of um, crunchy toast, like crunchy toast with butter because I could feel the, the butter. And I ate noodles, noodles with butter. Like I wanted slippery and I wanted softer, I wanted crunch. And that was it. And that's what I did for, and chicken soup, just cause I was hoping that would help. And I did that for, and then eventually I, I got my, I got everything went back to normal, but um, it was, it was <laughs> as a food professional, it was awful. And for everyone who has suffered from this and a, fr a couple of friends of mine have had COVID-19 and have lost their sense of smell and taste. And um, I, they they talk about crunchy, like saltines, like crunchy saltines. And like, that's a very satisfying, um, so I would say go with texture rather than flavor and it'll come back and it'll be amazing. And then that first time I could smell the ginger in my pocket, it's like, ah, oh, it was the best thing ever. I think you're absolutely right that saltines are, um, they're a pandemic lockdown treat. Um, we make party boards with the, and chop every, lots of little bits of cheese and olives and various meats and then, uh, sleeve of saltines and it makes it just delicious. Um, Sharon, one of our viewers, um, has a question about making red beans and rice exciting. And I'm confused by this because red beans and rice are exciting. Um, I, I make them so with smoked ham hocks um, or smoked uh, turkey necks or with bacon if I have it. But I, 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 um, I don't know how I would go beyond that. That's the sort of question that I turned to my colleague, Melissa Clark, 
to answer because she always has an idea that is so smart. Whereas mine is just add more smoked meat. Well, but you have the citrus. Yes, but no, this is for red beans and okay. rice, right? So, right. so, so you, that's only for black thinking, beans. This, this, is, this is, I mean, I use it with red beans to tell you the truth, but my yeah. assumption is that Sharon's question is to the kind of New Orleans Southern right. dish, um, which is uh, the red beans. Also, there's generally some tomato in there, often smoked paprika and, and, right. and the like. And andouille, right? Is that the andouille? Andouille, is that yeah. Yeah. Um, what else do you think you could add to a pot of red beans for red beans and rice? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get yelled at for like being like, you know, totally out of the, <laughs> for being like, you know, let's just get out of tradition here. Um, but I mean, personally, I would add, I would add green, I would add greens. I would add herbs and greens, something to lighten that because I love red beans and rice and I love it classic, but it's heavy. And so my instinct is lighter. I want to put spinach in there. I want to put celery tops. So I would put, okay, you know, um, for like a classic, um, you know, you, when you're making, when you're doing Cajun food, you're often starting with like the, um, the bell pepper, the onion, right? And the celery, like that is your little, you know, foundation of all the dishes. I would save th some of that raw and I would add it to at the end. So you have the cooked version and then you have the fresh raw and put that right on top. So that is what I would do. I know people may send me hate mail. That's okay. I can handle it. But uh, um, I would, I would go there. I would do bright, fresh, crunchy, raw. I love it. And I don't think you're going to get any hate mail for that. I think that actually I myself would suggest um, a sturdy green that can stand up to the heat a little bit. I find every time I do stuff like that with, with spinach, it melts so quickly. Um, whereas with a, you know, with a kale or a collard or something, uh, it'll hold up for a little while and still give you that crunch uh, against the richness of the beans. Um, we've got a question from a woman named Heather. I sh should say a person named Heather, um, who wants to know about how much you're and I am ordering out and, and how you're wrestling with um, wanting to support restaurants or wanting to get fricking restaurant food um, and not wanting to endanger uh, either um, the delivery workers mm -hmm. or yourself. Um, this, I will say before we talk about it, I will say that our colleague, the critic Tejal Rao, who's the California restaurant critic for the New York Times is wrestling with this very subject um, in a notebook that we are publishing on nytimes.com um, overnight into, in, into the morning. Um, and it's a really serious question, not just a, not just a, a, a practical one, but an ethical one. What, um, what are we doing here? Yeah. Um, um, have you ordered much takeout, Melissa? We haven't. And you know, Sam, you, you talked about this last time, because I think you had talked to Don Mc, Donald McNeil yes. about some of the, the issues. Um, so you should so probably- Don I'll just interrupt you to yeah, tell the please. audience that Donald McNeil is, of course, the legendary um, science reporter from the New York Times whose whose life mission has been covering stuff like this um, and who talked a little bit um, with me and with with others about um, takeout food earlier uh, in in our pandemic shutdown. Um, and his at that point, his advice was, if you do it, the real danger um, is the plastic containers that the food comes in. Um, and his advice was not to order any uh, raw food, no salads or sushi, um, but uh, instead right. um, cooked food and to be careful of the containers. Yeah, so I mean, we haven't really been ordering in. Um, we did a little bit. I want to support restaurants so badly and I miss going out to eat so badly. Um, I have been donating to a lot of the restaurants in my neighborhood and beyond my neighborhood, just restaurants that I love in the city. They have funds for their workers and I've been donating money. I've been buying gift certificates. I've been, I haven't been buying merchandise just cause I don't wanna buy, st I don't want stuff, but like I'm happy to donate and I'm happy to buy gift certificates. So I've been going that route. Um, yeah, I just, um, I don't know. I just feel maybe it'll change, you know, as it's depending on how long we're we are um, on this social distancing plan. But right now I'm feeling better about cooking. Um, we did order some burgers from a local place and they were delicious. 
<laughs> ah, that sounds amazing. I would love a, so I would good. love a delicious restaurant burger so much right now. It's interesting. There's I there's a restaurateur near uh, my home who um, uh, Sinjin Frizzell who runs Fort Defiance yeah. in the Red Hook yeah. neighborhood of Brooklyn, and he's converted um, his restaurant into what he's calling a general store. And he's trying to continue to buy from his wholesalers, but then sell out uh, um, uh, the front door, um, the material, the stuff that he was buying, which is a really interesting, uh, you know, uh, as long as he can do it in a way that he feels safe and is safe for his, his workers, it's a real boon to his neighbors who are That's able amazing. suddenly to get incredible fish and, 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 and shellfish uh, and, and vegetables. Um, in a, in a completely new uh, business model. It's, um, it, it's something, it's something to, to wrestle with. And I urge everyone uh, to check out the New York Times tomorrow to see what our Tejal Rao has to say about it in her critics notebook on this subject. Now, Melissa, we, we've been talking seriously for some time now. Um, I've got here in my uh, question feed, one from a millennial scamp, um, who's interested to know what's the best cereal, not generally, but specifically between Fruit Loops and Lucky Charms? Oh God, I I am a Fruit Looper. Those Lucky Charms, the, those little marshmallows, those marshmallows are disgusting. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. I, I mean Fruit Loops, but where is Captain Crunch? Where's peanut butter? Yeah, I know it, it. The question, the question is ridiculous, but yeah. it does get us into a, a more interesting question about cereal in, in general. And I want to include the sweetened uh, cereals there very much because I think um, Captain Crunch trumps both of those. hundred percent. I'm with you. Um, how about some others? Are there oh. some commercial ones that you like? Oh, well, there's Cocoa obviously. Pebbles. Oh, I find that vile. Oh, I love it. Because the way really it gets the milk all chocolatey, I love it. And then they crunch oh. it. Oh, it's so good. So good. I think that I think that the milk left over from Captain Crunch is one of the great elixirs of uh, the world. I mean, Captain Crunch is my favorite, especially I love peanut butter Captain Crunch too. Those are the best. But I do love um I do love uh, cocoa pebbles, not fruity pebbles. Um, what else do I, I mean, you know what? When was the last time you had cornflakes? Like cornflakes in a bowl with bananas and a little bit, and then yeah, not, I don't do frosted flakes, but I actually put some sugar on the cornflakes, just a little, just to spread. It is just so a tiny good. bit. It's yeah, so that's good. That's actually legitimate. I wonder why it is that we've never come up with an alternate use for Cheerios than, than feeding our children. Like <laughs> it's one of the most popular cereals in America. And yet we don't coat fried chicken in Cheerios. I wonder, maybe that's a challenge to you as this thing goes on to figure I out a way to use Cheerios? Cheerios. I think that by the time we're done feeding our toddlers, our babies and our toddlers with Cheerios, we are so sick of Cheerios. Like I, and personally, if I never saw another Cheerio again, I'd be fine. Like I have no love of Cheerios. I mean, I like the honey nut to eat, but you're not gonna put that on fried chicken. Although maybe. No, that's 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 definitely true. And it, I think you're, you've are you convinced me. You're absolutely right. My kids are 18 and 16 and I still find Cheerios. They're like next to the Legos. That you, it's, they're <laughs> everywhere. It's like the glitter of cereal. Oh my uh, God, yes. Here's, here's a more serious question that I'd like us to, to, to mess with. It, it comes from a reader named, or viewer named Dottie. Um, and Dottie wants to know if she should be disinfecting her fruit and vegetables oh. um, when she gets home from the store. And if so, how to do that? Okay, What's your, I, I can tell you what I do. You tell me what you do. I mean, I heard that you don't have to. I mean, I give them a wash. I certainly give them a wash. But I heard that you don't, it's like you don't need to be rubbing alcohol on them or Clorox on them. Um, I mean, I put them in the sink and I give them a good rinse. I wash my salad greens. But that's all I do. I mean, and that I heard was okay. But you know, tell me if I'm wrong, Sam. What do you do? And is it is there a better plan? I, I, I'm I'm with you 100. percent We have an ongoing um, argument in the family about um, about raw greens um, and whether we think um, that you know a, a a triple wash after the triple wash yeah. is uh, enough. Um, it probably is. 
but I'm also mindful of the fact that adolescents um, believe themselves to be uh, incapable of being harmed. And I wanna stress as much as possible that we're in a difficult health situation and that I would prefer those greens to be cooked. Um, that's why I brought up the cabbage because once you have, and, and you brought up carrots earlier, um, any uh, carrots, any any time that you can kind of get that exterior off and, and reveal the delicious clean vegetable within, I feel a lot more um, mm. comfortable, at least with my kids. Yeah. Because I, I just don't know that children or adolescents um, can really grok, uh, to use that 90s term, really understand um, how uh, how terrifying this this invisible um, enemy really really is. Um, yeah. But I, I I too uh, believe that we don't need to be bleaching our our vegetables. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do think that um, the it, it, the stuff I've heard is that it's I mean, it's not going to survive that long. On so another thing you can do is you could quarant. We we've, we've been quarantining our greens so because yeah. it doesn't last on a surface like a like um on a. a food surface more than 24 hours it's like an outside that's what i've heard so if you take those greens and you put them in the fridge and you don't touch them for a couple of days then let's I think hope we're that, okay so that's what we've been doing we because we love salad we eat a lot of raw salad but i just put it in the fridge for a few days so we were talking earlier melissa about the restaurant industry and um a, it it's facing a sort of it could be catastrophic what happens to to the restaurant industry and in the United States. Some uh, estimates put um, the rate of closure, permanent closure, uh, up in the 70% area. It's really, really scary. Um, my question to you is, what do you, what do you think your relationship with restaurants is going to be like as we come out of this? Oh my God, I'm going to go out to eat every single night. I'm going to eat three meals a day out for a while. I'm just going to, and I mean, I love my own cooking. Like it's going to actually be a little bit hard, but I just, I want to do the most I can to support all the restaurants. And, you know, especially though, there's going to be ones that open and maybe they don't know if they can stay open, you know, like the smaller mom and pop places, that's where I'm going to go and try to like help them along, you know, like, yeah, that's what I, I mean, as soon as I can, as soon as it's safe and as soon as we get the okay, I will be eating. I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat two dinners every night. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, there are a couple of restaurants that I miss. Like I, like I miss family members right now. It's, oh, it's, yes. It's, it's just, really, it's, it's really painful for, I mean, more for them than for us, but you know, but in the meantime, we're stuck at home and we're cooking and our readers and viewers have questions. Um, Asmagi um, is really interested in asking us what kind of salt to cook with. And I presume that this question isn't like you should cook. He's not looking for an answer like uh, it should be Himalayan, sea salt, Himalayan pink salt or what have you. I get a lot of questions about this and maybe you can help um, break down the answers between the, the kosher salt that we often call for in mm -hmm. our recipes at nytcooking.com and the, and the stuff that you see marked as table salt in, in the market. What's the difference between table salt and kosher salt and which do you use and why in your cooking? Yeah, this is a really big issue. This is something that comes up a lot. Um, and even there's so much variation between kosher salts too. So it makes it so hard to tell people. I have, you know, I've, I keep going back and forth on whether I should give salt amounts for savory dishes. And you know what I mean? Like maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should just do it. And so I've been changing the way I write recipes because the, the salinity levels of all the different salts are completely different. And about, I've do, I do this every couple of years. I do a test to see how salty things are just to remind myself. So what I do is I take all the salts that I have. I have two different kinds of kosher salt. I have Morton's and Diamond, which are the two 
brands that you see most often in the States. Um, and then I have table salt and table salt is iodized generally. So to, um, iodine is added, which has a certain flavor. So table salt has a, a slightly different flavor. Kosher salt is very pure. It's um, there's no minerality to it at all. And then there are salts like um, sea salt, which has a certain amount of minerality to it. So it has like a slight tang. So it's a slightly different. I mean, it's, you can barely taste them, but if you're, if you dissolve the same amount of salt, say you, you take a cup of, you take, you know, a bunch of cups of water and you dissolve a teaspoon of salt in each one and you taste the different what you taste the saline levels. They taste all the salts. It really like brings out how different these salts are. Um, and the most important thing is that what we call for kosher salt, diamond crystal, is half as salty as Morton's. So we don't call for brands because it's not what we do, but it can mess somebody up, especially when you're using a teaspoon or two teaspoons of salt. So this is a real issue. And I don't actually know how, like, how do we work around this? So I've been trying to scale back on my salt and then have people take, cue people to taste. Um, I use diamond crystal. I find it just um, flakier. It's slightly flakier. So I find it easier. What I'm looking for in a salt is a neutral flavor. And I want to be able to, when I pick some up in my hands, I want to know exactly how much is in there. I want to be able to do it by feel. So diamond crystal for me is the salt that is most comfortable because of the flakiness and because I can pick it up and know how much I'm using. It doesn't matter what kind you use. You just have to be familiar enough with it so that when you're cooking with it, you know how much to use by feel. So you don't have to get out a measuring spoon. So, so what you're really saying is it's a function of surface area or a function of density of the salt, right? Yes. Table salt, so there's much more, and salt is salt. It's just, and there, there can be some differences yeah. because of other things that are in there with uh, the sodium chloride, but yeah. it's sodium chloride and it's about the question of how much is in a particular volume. So with table salt, there's a lot more sodium chloride in the tablespoon than there is with diamond crystal and diamond crystals volume in a tablespoon is different from that of Morton's is different from that of Malden sea salt exactly. or Himalayan pink salt. Great. So basically if what we're saying is salt, salt, but know how much salt is in a pinch. Like how salty is a pinch? Exactly. Correct? Yeah, exactly. And, um, just be consistent, like always buy the same salt so that you can be confident when you're salting and don't listen to the recipe. You know better than the recipe. So if you think it's going to be too salty, just hold back a little bit because your yeah. salt may be different. It's really important. Um, here We're um, coming up to the end here, folks. We've had a wonderful cocktail hour with you. Um, at least I've enjoyed my cocktail and Melissa seems to be enjoying hers. She's I know, I realized I'm, I'm, I was talking so much I wasn't drinking, so I have to, you know. <laughs> um, I've got a question from Janice. Um, this is about recipes. People are so interested and for the right reasons are so interested in, in how we write these recipes. Uh, it's a question about um, when a recipe says to simmer something or to boil something, but doesn't specifically call for uh, covering the pot or pan, does that mean to leave the cover off? Yes. Right. Full right? stop. There you go, Janice. Melissa Clark has spoken. Okay, here's the question. It doesn't here's, say covered or partially question. covered. Don't cover it. <laughs> right. Yeah, you want follow the directions. <laughs> um, here's a question for you. What's the most surprising thing that you can tell our viewers tonight that you can freeze and save for later? Like, can you freeze eggs? Yes. Yes, you can oh, freeze eggs. I'm I surprised. know people, it, well, I mean, think about it. You know, you, if you bake, you've probably free, you've probably frozen either egg whites or egg yolks. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you bake something and you've got the extra whites, or you got the extra yolks. So guess what? You can freeze them together too. They're fine. Take them out of the shell because otherwise they'll crack. So just crack your, you know, crack the eggs, put them in a container and throw them in the freezer. And it's just, but eggs last a really long time in the fridge. They really do. They I wouldn't really be freezing long. eggs. I, you, you I would freeze eggs as a, just to show that I could do it, but I can't imagine that I would need to. They last for they last for forever and ever. Is there anything, you recently wrote a story for um, 
NYT cooking um, about how you can freeze almost anything. Is, is there anything you can't freeze? Potatoes. Have you ever frozen a stew with potatoes in it and then you defrost it in the stew and the potatoes are all like slimy? Potatoes mm. don't do yeah, they're not good. So no, don't don't freeze your potatoes. Um, cut certain um, dairy products will separate, but you can usually rehomogenize them, get them soft again. So you can freeze heavy cream milk and half and half, which I think is great for people to know because you know how you always like have to buy a big huge thing of half and half, and sometimes you just want a little bit, and then you have this. What are you going to do, right? Throw it in the freezer. If it separates, put it in the blender, <laughs> and it'll come back together. Oh no, nice. And bring it and bring it back. Yes, yeah. will it blend? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Um, we're about five minutes out from the end of our, our programming. I just want to um, attend to some logistics before asking you a, a final question or two there, Melissa. I want to thank everybody who has uh, dialed into this uh, meeting for joining us for the happy hour. I'd like to let you know that you can find out more about our full slate of digital events. Um, just go to timesevents.nytimes.com and then come back next Monday, April 13, for a call at 4 p.m. Eastern time with me and our restaurant critics, Pete Wells, Tejal Rao, and Besha Rodell, who will be dialing in from Australia. We're going to be discussing the health of the restaurant industry or the ill health of the restaurant industry, and we look forward to speaking with you again. I'll give you a sign off when we're done here, but I got to finish things up with Melissa Clark and our cocktail here. Melissa, we talked about what you're um, going to do for uh, dinner this evening. I'm curious about what your breakfast game is. What are you going to do for breakfast tomorrow? Well, okay, so I'm really lucky. My husband is one of those sourdough bakers. He makes sour, we have a sourdough going, we always have bread. I am super lucky. And so our breakfast, I mean, um, I'm not a huge breakfast person, but when eventually I, I kind of eat more like 10, 11, but um, my whole, we all have big thick pieces of toast, tons of butter and jam. And then usually we do jammy eggs or we'll do fried eggs, you know, something like that. Um, I love to do, sometimes I'll do the big, the toast and I'll put either cottage cheese or ricotta cheese on top of it. And then I'll put fruit on that and put honey on it. But it's all, it's, it's toast time. Breakfast is toast. What do you do for breakfast? Wow. Well, I have to say that since I've, I'm not a big breakfast guy generally, I try and get to the paper quite early and I'm uh, enamored of either a bacon, egg and cheese at the oh. deli across the street from the newspaper or a donut or something. And I just get through the, the morning. But now that we're sheltered in place, one of my kids has become an uh, avocado toast master and I live for the delivery of this amazing concoction in the morning of homemade bread, um, uh, avocado mashed with lime juice and, and, and salt, um, a, a just beautifully cooked by my kid, uh, um, egg over easy, Maybe a little bit of bean sprouts on top, although that's off brand for me. <laughs> um, I just, I, it's just great. A couple splashes of hot sauce and, mm. and, it's, and it's fantastic. I can't wait um, to, to eat that. Uh, that sounds amazing. Morning. It's it's the one time of the day when I get served the food. Oh, the so rest nice. of the time I'm making other people um, food. Speaking of which, Melissa, as I said, I don't have time to make a big boson tonight. I'm gonna cook it, I guess, into the night and, and make something tomorrow with it. Yeah. Um, don't you think that'll work? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and then tomorrow you'll be so happy. Tomorrow you will say, oh, thank you yesterday, me. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just rip it up. We'll have a kind of version exactly. of pulled pork or, or something along those uh, lines. Melissa, thank you for sharing your cocktail hour with me and with all of our lovely readers who have asked such great questions. And uh, I hope everyone can stay safe and happy and um, filled with promise for tomorrow and coming days. We're here at the New York Times to help you. Uh, please come and visit us at nytcooking.com, nytimes.com. Tons of our coverage is, is free for the taking as we weather this coronavirus pandemic together. 
Thanks very much for joining us and have a safe and pleasant evening. Thank you.